You're listening to Natural Resources University. In this podcast network, our hosts are university researchers and extension specialists, opening your gateway to the science of natural resource management. Pond University is your one-stop shop for all things pond management. It is hosted by Mitchell Ziski and Megan Gunn from Purdue University and Illinois Indiana Sea Grant. Join us as we talk with biologists, managers, and pond owners about the topics and tools needed to manage your pond for good habitat and great fishing. So grab a notebook and a beverage and sit back and enjoy Pond University. G'day everyone and welcome back to Pond University. Uh, I'm Mitch, one of your hosts, and I'm joined with Megan. Hi Megan, how are you? I'm good, Mitch. How are you doing? I'm doing great. It's, um, you know, summer's finally arrived here. It's uh, We've got some great warm weather and uh, I know it's summer when my grass starts growing like an inch a day, so mm-hmm. <laughs> so I feel like I'm constantly mowing the grass. But, um, Same. Yeah, but it's great to see some warm weather and, um, you know, we uh, it's not just our lawns that are growing fast. The vegetation in our ponds are growing fast and the ponds are heating up as well. And, and uh, you know, you should have, if you've got some ponds here in the Midwest, you should have uh, hopefully seen some of your fish spawning or starting mm-hmm. to spawn. Um, and so it's really, you know, the, the birds and the bees and the trees and the grass and the it's the same in our ponds. Everything's happening <laughs> and, and they're getting active. And hopefully you've been able to get out and do some fishing in your ponds as well. Have you done anything exciting over the past uh, few weeks? I have been super busy working on a summer research program that I coordinate with Purdue students. Um, So they're out right now collecting their research. They developed their projects a couple weeks ago, and they are out working in streams and working in the habitat and working with mammals and doing cicada surveys, which are super cool. Um, Some of the students are actually doing pond research, too. And so there's a group that is looking at snapping turtles. Um, so they're collecting snapping turtles and may or may not be bleeding them. So we'll see about that soon. And then another group is looking at the fish population in those in those ponds. So they're using different types of equipment um, to test and collect what type of fish are in, in these ponds that are on our properties. Okay, that's great. Maybe we should get these students on at one of our episodes. They can tell us a little bit about their research and and what they're finding with these snapping turtles and the fish populations. I'm sure that'd be yeah, really interesting. Yeah, they would love that. Yeah, our listeners would probably really like that. So, Thinking uh, thinking about ponds and, and some of the things that change in ponds as the weather warms up is, you know, I'm sure a lot of our listeners have started to see vegetation grow. Maybe they've had some, some algae blooming uh, or growing filamentous algae. But one of the things that we can get in our ponds and lakes too are um, cyanobacteria or blue green algae and and these can sometimes cause harmful algal blooms and so um, we've got a, a great guest lined up for us today um, from aquatic control again and she's going to talk to us about um, harmful algal blooms how why they occur how to identify them and and more importantly how to manage them and to keep your pond safe essential pond terms the segment where we hope to expand your vocabulary by defining important terms for pond management. One term that you'll hear in today's episode is nitrogen to phosphorus ratio. This is simply the ratio of nitrogen concentration to phosphorus concentration in the water. To calculate this ratio, you will need to measure nitrogen and phosphorus concentrations in the same units, for example in parts per million. Then you just compare the nitrogen measurement to the phosphorus measurement. The nitrogen concentration will typically be higher than phosphorus, and the target ratio for ponds in the Midwest is about 17 to 1, which means that nitrogen is 17 times higher than phosphorus. When this ratio decreases, say to 10 to 1, this is when harmful algae like cyanobacteria can bloom. Okay, so today we have Sierra Bad with um, Aquatic Control, and she's an aquatic ecotoxicologist, uh, and she's going to be talking to us today about all things harmful algal bloom. So, hi, Sierra. How are you? I'm great. How are you doing? I'm great. Thanks for joining us today. Absolutely. Um, it's uh, some nice summer weather outside, and um, you know, I imagine uh, things are really ramping up there at Aquatic Control with 
with um, assessing ponds and treating ponds and that sort of thing? Oh, yes. This is the time of year when things get quite busy, as you can imagine, as the, the weather warms up. So do the algae and plants. <laughs> yeah. Great. Well, it's it's great to have you on the uh, the program today. Um, we're really excited to, to talk about harmful algal blooms. We get a lot of questions about them from landowners and, and um, you know, they can sometimes be a little confused by them and, you know, why they pop up and, and stuff like that. So we're really looking forward to, to getting some information from you and some tips about how to prevent and manage them. But um, but before we get started on that, um, you know, our listeners like to learn a little bit about our guests. So, um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about your background, you know, um, what you what you got your degree in, how you ended up where you are now, and, and some of the things that you've done, um, you know, to get to where you are today. Yeah, so I actually started getting my bachelor's degree in Pennsylvania at Keystone College, which is near Scranton, if you're familiar with the office. I always like to use that <laughs> as a reference point. But I graduated from there in 2012 with a bachelor's degree in wildlife biology and a minor in chemistry. And then pretty quickly after that, I decided I wanted to pursue graduate education. So I landed down at Clemson University in Clemson, South Carolina. And I worked with Dr. John Rogers for both my master's degree and my doctorate. So on my master's degree, I actually worked on something quite different. I did um, studies around treatment of oil sands, process affected waters using constructed wetlands. But then while I was working on that master's degree, I got to collaborate with my other lab mates who were working on some really neat projects involving solving problems around nuisance algae and, and problematic algae. And so I got some really neat exposure while I was working on my master's degree, just working with um, you know my other lab mates and getting to some, publish some really neat research there. So I started to get interested in it and then I decided, you know what, I'm just gonna stay on and do a PhD. And so for my doctorate, my research was all around toxin producing algae. So a lot of it had to do with understanding better the risks associated with those toxin exposures to people and to animals and plants, and then other studies involving uh, ways to use algicides more effectively and efficiently to control those problems. So that really gave me a really solid foundation to kind of land at aquatic control. So I graduated with my PhD in 2018 from Clemson, and then a couple months later, I had started with the company. So for what I do for aquatic control now is my title is aquatic ecotoxicologist, as you said, specializing in harmful algal bloom management. So what I do is supervise all of our projects related to management of harmful algae, just like it says. So anything having to do with toxin production or taste and odor production by algae, I oversee those projects, help design those management plans. And I also supervise our laboratory services provide technical support to other areas of the business and work on research both internally and um, collaborative with other partners. That sounds amazing. Great. Thank you. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> yeah, so you sort of, you know, started in Midwesty or, you know, is, is, is uh, Scranton considered the Midwest still? I don't know. No, Northeast. <laughs> Northeast, okay. Yeah, yeah. we... Um, we head out to we we go out to Cape Cod in the summers for a little bit, and we we drive out there, and we always see the sign to Scranton, and I always think yeah. back to the office, and I'm like, we should really call in there one day. <laughs> you should. Um, yeah. yeah, well, that's great. I'm sure you know. I I know from a from a fish production and fish management side of things, you know, there's definitely some differences between the Midwest and and down south um, with re, with regards to pond management, and and I imagine there are some differences with vegetation and, and algae as well. Um, and you know, it'd be, uh, great to, to, to learn a little bit more about, about these harmful or nuisance algae and, and, you know, what they are and, and what they do and, and stuff like that. So, um, um, so that's great. Thanks. Thanks for the overview of, of what you've done. And, and I'm sure you could probably talk to us a lot about your graduate research. Um, you know, I, I can, I feel like I've talked to people too much about my graduate research, so, yeah. <laughs> so I don't do that anymore, but, um. But yeah, it sounds like you're perfectly suited to uh, to answer some of our questions about harmful algae. So, yeah, what what makes a harmful algal bloom? Where does it go from being just regular algae to harmful? 
Yeah, so you'll probably hear a few different definitions for this, and some people just focus on blue-green algae, which I feel like we'll probably be talking mostly about today. But my definition for harmful algal bloom is just a visually dense accumulation of algae or cyanobacteria that can interfere with the intended uses of a water. So, you know, if you think about how limited fresh water is on this earth and all the different ways that we use it, problems can arise very quickly if you've got algae interfering with that intended use, you know, all the way from potable water to fish and wildlife propagation, recreation and tourism, and then you get into the industry, irrigation, agriculture, aquaculture, you know, the list goes on. So whether that's due to toxin production, taste and odor production, physical clogging of pipes, you know, presenting a risk to swimmers. There, there's a lot of different issues that can arise. So I wouldn't just limit it to blue-green algae, but commonly when you hear that term, that is that, that is what people are talking about. That's good to know. That is, I mean, that's what I think about when I hear harmful algal blooms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I think I think that uh, the nuisance algae as as a term is useful because you know um, when you get the filamentous algae you know choking out a, a, a water body that can't be used and mm -hmm. you know it's it's technically not harmful to us but it you know it prevents us recreating in that water body and it and it's and it's something that needs to be managed accordingly right so yeah whether it's a physical risk or a human health risk you know from something being in your body but also from a whole economic perspective too right i mean now we have cases of livestock dying lower crop yields from using waters that were contaminated with algal toxins. You know, we're finding that plants are very, very sensitive to exposures of these toxins now. So that's a whole other dish, um, issue that we're uh, coming across. But then things like property value, right? Like if you live on a lake with a really expensive house and you have this reoccurring algal bloom year after year, nobody's going to want to buy that house if they hear about sure. those problems. <laughs> And then, you know, if a lake has to shut down a swimming beach, that might not attract, you know, as the normal number of visitors that they might have every year. So there really are some very severe ripple effects uh, from mm -hmm. these from these blooms. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, um, I have a friend, a good friend who, who just moved back out to Kansas, but they her parents have a, a house on a small lake out there. And, you know, she remembers as a kid going out there all the time and spending you know, weekends at the lake. And for the past four or five years, I've been battling some harmful algal blooms out there yeah. and they basically can't use their boat. They can't swim. And, and the, wow. her parents are looking to sell their house because it's not the place that they want it to be anymore. And so mm -hmm. you're right, Sierra, that these can have huge implications to, to, you know, the economy, to, to people's recreation, to their social and, and cultural values. So, um, yeah, it's, re it's a really important issue. Absolutely. So uh, I guess one question that I have, you know, if we're thinking about algae as a as a broad group, you know, we we can think of you know um, filamentous algae potentially being a nuisance, you know, um, problem, or you know, the cyanobacteria from a harmful algal standpoint. Are there are there different processes that might lead to blooms of, of those different groups, or or are the processes quite similar that may lead to a to a to a bloom of of these algae? Yeah, so if we're talking about, I guess maybe let's focus on cyanobacteria for a second, um, and that's what is referred to as blue-green algae. And the reason it has that name is those organisms produce a photosynthetic pigment called phycocyanin, that's blue. So whereas all you know regular algae produce chlorophylls, that makes them that nice bright green color, you see this blue-green color with cyanobacteria, and that's the mixture of the phycocyanin and chlorophyll. Um, but that those organisms are actually the oldest photosynthetic organisms on Earth. So they are very well adapted wow. to survive a range of conditions. And they have some pretty unique traits that make them quite competitive compared to other algae. So, for example, they have um, gas vacuoles inside their cells, which help them maintain their buoyancy in the water column. Okay. So whereas other planktonic algae, um, green algae and diatoms, for example, cannot do that, cyanobacteria can actually raise and lower themselves in the water <laughs> column to obtain access to sunlight and nutrients, and that really makes them quite competitive. And if you've seen, you know, those algal blooms where it, it looks kind of like a scum, that's because all of those cells are floating up to the surface and forming these dense accumulations. So Okay. Interesting. Yeah, and and what gets to that point is when, you know, obviously there has to be quite a 
high cell density for that to happen. So cyanobacteria are a natural part of all aquatic systems. They can occur in freshwater, brackish water, lakes, ponds, streams, rivers, reservoirs, you know, you name it. But when their densities start to grow, that's usually because there's some sort of nutrient imbalance in the water, usually excess phosphorus, what we call eutrophication, or, um, you know, just the, the conditions that make it right for cyanobacteria to thrive, which is really warm temperatures, stagnant water, things like that. So um, cyanobacteria have quite a higher heat tolerance than other algae too. So in the summer, when pond water gets up into the 80 degree, you know, range, they're thriving, whereas other mm -hmm. algae would start to crash at that point. So. Okay. Yeah, that temperature component is is interesting to consider because I think a lot of people earlier in the spring will get a a bloom of phytoplankton or, or filamentous algae and and then um, you know later on they might get a bloom of cyanobacteria or, and and they wonder you know why why do I get one at one point of the time and one at the other point in time so I think thinking about the the temperature tolerances of those different groups um, can maybe help explain some of that. Yeah, and that's a very natural succession in most freshwater systems where you see the diatoms, which are the algae with the silica cell walls early in the spring and the green algae, and they tend to do better in the cooler water temperatures. And then that's in the summer is when you really see the, the cyanobacteria take over in most systems. And these, these algae can be found in any ponds. And so how do they get there, especially in like a newly established pond? How... How does the algae become a problem? Or yeah, and so cells can actually be carried by wind. I know that sounds kind of crazy, but if there's a nearby water body, they can actually be aerosolized and, and carried in the air. That's one way. Or if the pond is receiving runoff from, you know, other other waters, if it's getting inflows from nearby streams or just runoff from, you know, just the, the surrounding land, that's that's how they can make it there. And then just depending on what the specific water characteristics are for that system and and the, you know, just the the size of the water body, is it is it flowing, is it relatively stagnant? But really I think nutrient uh, conditions are what dominate, you know, or determine rather what, what's gonna thrive there. So I know, you know, I talk to a lot of pond owners about about algae in general and, and for a lot of in a lot of cases it's filamentous algae and, and one of the things we, we talk to them about is trying to prevent that and trying to minimize nutrients that enter the pond and, and things like that and and so um, are there differences in the in the nutrient requirements between um, you know green algae and and cyanobacteria or or is it just that the temperature that sort of se um, separates those groups and when they bloom uh, it's a little bit of both. We have found that green algae require a slightly higher nitrogen to phosphorus ratio. So okay. um, there's not, you know, rock solid proof behind this. Of course, everything is just supported by evidence and science. But generally, as we see that nitrogen to phosphorus ratio decrease below 10 to 1 is when you start to see the cyanobacteria thrive. And then when you get above the 17 to 1, which is kind of seen as the gold standard, that's when the green algae start to thrive. So green algae definitely have higher nitrogen requirements to make up their cells. And then um, cyanobacteria also have this unique trait called luxury consumption where they can take up more phosphorus than they actually need and reserve it for when it's not actually available. Huh. So, <laughs> oh, okay. But that's another way that they win the race, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, so um, is it, do you often see uh, cyanobacteria out competing green algae in, in some cases, or, or um, do you get them, do, you, do they coexist together? Like, do you get blooms of both? Like, how does the, how do the dynamics between those groups of algae work? Yeah, you can definitely see both at a given time, but in situations where you see, you know, a dense bloom of cyanobacteria, you're likely not going to see too much green algae. And that's because, again, if they're forming those surface scums, they're actually, you know, in addition to just getting access to most of the, the nutrients in that water and kind of dominating the system. If you think about just the physical barrier that that surface scum is making, they're shading out any algae that could be growing below there too. Yeah. Yeah. So, I... yeah, so when you see those blooms, you're probably not going to see too many other um, algae in the water column. Now, maybe in the benthic areas, if there's algae more adapted to lower, you know, lower light levels, then there's probably some other populations growing down there as well. 
Um, all right, so we have these algae in the pond. You know, they're all naturally occurring in the pond, and then and then the green algae and 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 um, blue green algae. You know, they can bloom if if circumstances are right with nutrients and temperature and stuff like that. Um, you know, I think a lot of you know, uh, I think just about every pond owner is probably familiar with with green algae and and blooms of green algae with filamentous algae clinging to things and. Um, but you know, maybe some of them, if they're lucky, they haven't really had to deal with blooms of, of blue green algae, cyanobacteria, um, you know, and, and we know that, <clears throat> you know, green algae, filamentous algae, they can really clog up a system, impede our use if we want to swim or fish or whatever. Um, but, but cyanobacteria can have some other impacts to the system and, and to, to people as well. And so can you explain what, what, what makes these cyanobacteria potentially more harmful? Yeah, so many genera of cyanobacteria are capable of producing different toxins. So um, the most common ones that you've probably heard of are microcystins and cylindrospermopsin. Those are both liver and kidney toxins. And then there's anatoxin A, which is a potent neurotoxin. And so these compounds are produced, um, they're, they're basically called secondary metabolites, which means that the cyanobacteria don't need to produce them to survive. It's more of a an added benefit to them. Many researchers have hypothesized that it's a defense mechanism or just a competitive mechanism to make sure that they can dominate the system. But but yeah, they toxins are produced, they can be produced never, they can be produced sometimes or consistently. And much research has been done to explore triggers for that. And a lot of it has to do with whether those genes for toxin production are activated or not. But um, I believe, you know, just based on my experience, too, that a lot of it has to do with whether or not those cells have the right resources to not just survive and grow, but then use that extra energy to go on and produce those compounds as well. So we tend to see most toxin production occurring in, in the peak of the summer when they've got long day length, you know, plenty of heat, access to nutrients. And then in the spring and fall is when you tend to see less toxin production, even if you have a really dense bloom. Interesting. And so you don't, there doesn't seem to be, uh, or there's not a link between say density of cyanobacteria and whether or not the toxins are, are being produced. Not necessarily. And, you know, sometimes you could say, it, say, if you went out to the same pond within the span of a few weeks or something, if it started out light density and then you went back and it was even more dense, potentially then if you were dealing with the same assemblage. But from May to, you know, the end of the year, October, September, October timeline, not necessarily um, at all. You could have a really dense bloom and not really have much toxin production in the in the hmm. fall months when it's kind of cooler and they have shorter day lengths. And I think that's just because they don't have all the resources they need to, you know, go on and produce all those extra compounds. So the is it only harmful when it's producing these toxins or should we just kind of avoid it as much as possible, avoid those bodies of water as much as possible if we see it present? I would say the, the best route is to always use caution and avoid them if you see it. And that's only because you don't know if toxins are being produced or not when, when mm -hmm. you see that bloom. And even if it's, you know, early in the year or late in the year, that doesn't guarantee that it, they're not producing toxins. So the really, unfortunately, the only way to know is to have the water tested for toxins. Mm -hmm. and, and if you can't get it tested, then the best, you know, method is management or avoidance. So. And I guess too, the fact that, um, the that toxins can can be produced cannot be produced and, and i imagine it can change within a within a water body depending on the time of year if you if you notice a, a cyanobacteria bloom and you get the water tested and it it says there are no toxins there yeah, it's important to probably keep retesting right to make sure that those toxins don't show up at, a, at another stage during the during the year Yes, absolutely. And especially if you're dealing with a lake where you have, you know, residents all around the lake, then you really need to be keeping everyone educated about, hey, just because we didn't find toxins doesn't mean there can't be some tomorrow. So, mm -hmm. you know, just use your best judgment and, and keep your dogs out. That's usually <laughs> the, yeah. the best route until you can do something about it or, keep you know, keep checking, like you said. Um, is, is this testing, like, is it something that should be done daily? Is this something that, like, the, the homeowner can do, or is it something that should be done weekly by like an organization? So, so far there's no toxin testing available to private homeowners. They would have to submit those samples to a laboratory. And 
as far as frequency, I think that really depends on the site specific situations as well as budget, right? So um, typically when we do monitoring programs with our laboratory for different lakes, we have them on a, a weekly or bi-weekly monitoring schedule when there is a bloom present. And earlier in the year when things are just starting to ramp up, we might just be on a monthly schedule until we hit a detect. And then we say, okay, we might wanna check more frequently um, just to make sure that you know everybody's safe. Yeah, and I think the, the answer to a lot of the questions that we have with, with uh, bond owners and with, with people on this podcast too is it depends. And, and I think one of the things we've really tried to reiterate throughout our program here is that is the value of working with professionals and, mm -hmm. and you know, like, you know, well, number one for, for, for cyanobacteria, there isn't an at-home test for that. But, um, but I think if you've got one of these problems working with a professional can, you know, they'll have these these standards in place and you can um, you know they have these timelines set up so that they know when to how frequent to be doing the testing and, and things like that and that could be one of the real advantages of working with someone who's used to dealing with these issues yeah absolutely I mean if you you know just being an being a pond owner if you wanted to of course just be observant and make sure you're checking the water before you're letting kids or pets in that's that's one thing but yeah definitely Consulting with professionals to do toxin testing would be the best avenue, um, you know, if you want to be using that water on a regular basis. Yeah, I have a question related to that. So I know, like, we always hear that and talk about make sure you keep your kids and your and your dogs out of the water when you see these blooms. But is there anything that we can do or need to do for other wildlife that may be going near this body of water? Yeah, I mean we're dealing with all mammals, right? So of course people want to focus on their dogs and, and their livestock, but sure. I mean, there's, there's other animals that are going to be susceptible to those exposures. And unfortunately I just feel like our regulations and the way that um, the country as a whole has been going after managing these blooms is just not quite there yet to mm -hmm. really account for all of these ecological receptors that could be getting exposed the same way that, that we could be. So I think we've come a long way, but there's still a long way to go with risk management for sure. So, you know, these, these cyanobacteria can produce these toxins, which are harmful to, to mammals, it sounds like. Um, and is that through skin contact? Is that through drinking? Um, like how, how are these toxins harmful? And, um, you know, what groups are they, are they harmful to? Yeah, good question. So for, for people and animals, the primary exposure route is ingestion. So that would be, you know, if it was a, person who was drinking contaminated drinking water or, you know, a whole area of research that still needs a lot of work as well as food exposures, because there's some now studies coming out showing that crops irrigated with contaminated water can accumulate microcystins. And, hmm. you know, there are no regulations out there for food based exposures. But the primary way I would say, um, you know, that would lead to the potentially highest exposure is recreation. So if you're incidentally ingesting some water while swimming or taking in some water while, um, you know, during any other recreation activities on, on the water. And the reason why you see probably a lot more articles about dogs getting sick or dogs dying is just simply because of the way that they interact with the water, right? Dogs are not right. really going to care if they see a, a green scum on the water. So if you think about each one of those cells in that big bloom is producing a little bit of toxin, then the way you're going to get that highest exposure is to ingest most of that, you know, surface scum. So when dogs go swimming in the water, those cells can get trapped in their fur. They get out and lick their fur. They're taking in a whole mm -hmm. bunch of cyanobacteria cells. And then ways that people can get sick, of course, or you know, mainly you just see kids swimming and they're gulping down water while they're out there. So the ingestion is definitely the primary way that you can get exposed. From a dermal side of things, toxins are actually too large as a chemical structure to pass through our skin. So really when you see rashes and things like that, I believe it's more of just an allergic reaction to the cyanobacteria cells themselves, but okay. you do see very extreme skin reactions uh, from people who have been swimming in blooms. And then a whole other way you can get exposed is inhalation of aerosolized cyanobacteria huh. cells. So if you live on a lake that gets a lot of wind, or if you've been out, you know, jet skiing across the water, those cells can actually be aerosolized in water droplets and you breathe them in and you can get very severe asthmatic type responses. 
um, you know, just kind of like a dry throat, hard to breathe, things like that. Okay. Are most are most responses fatal? Or I guess are most responses kind of severe, or do they a lot of them lead to death? Um, it it would take quite a high exposure to lead to death. Um, it has happened. It definitely has happened. One of the most common case studies in the literature refers to a dialysis unit where over 100 people died when they had dialysis treatments using contaminated water. And that was simply just due to, you know, the the way that that exposure happened, because typically Mm -hmm. when you have dialysis treatments, that's three or four times a week. And there's, I think, a couple hundred liters of water that your body gets exposed to. Um, But it would take, you know, I think it would take a a pretty high exposure, uh, you know, via ingestion to cause death. And that that really only happens with dogs and cows and sheep and things like that, because they're just indiscriminately drinking from Mm -hmm. those surface gums. That makes sense. And so if if the toxins can be uh, aerosolized, does that mean if you have a bloom, you should turn off your aerators in your pond to prevent that? That's a good question. A lot of people um, ask about that. And I generally say, yes, if you've got um, a residence really close to that water and you can physically feel that spray coming at you, it probably would be a good idea to to turn that off for sure. Okay. And then I guess my last question here, you know, I don't want to um, dwell on doom and gloom and death too much, but um, <laughs> but I know a lot of people, you know, are worried about the, the non-mammal critters in their pond, so particularly their fish populations. And so are their fish populations impacted by this? And um, are they are people still, you know, can they still go fishing and eat those fish or should they hold off on those activities? Yeah, that's a good question. So fish and aquatic invertebrates are definitely sensitive to microcystin exposures and other toxin exposures. They seem to be a bit less sensitive than plants. But if you look at sort of that species sensitivity distribution, they're kind of right in the middle between plants and mammals. So in a pond or a lake where there is a consistent you know, presence of a bloom, what the research has shown is that as long as there's that consistent source of algae, the fish can, you know, via ingestion, start to accumulate toxins in their body. Now, the one positive thing is that microcystins, particularly since they're liver and kidney toxins, they're going to be found in those organs. So if you're just eating the filet, you know, the Mm -hmm. risk is a lot lower, but you still can't really know for sure, you know, when you see a pond with a bloom, you you can't predict what level is going to be, you know, in that fish and, and what would be safe. The research just isn't really there yet. So I would say if you did have a bloom on your pond, I would definitely not eat fish from that pond. Yeah. And I guess if you're getting these blooms consistently, you, you know, the, the potential for that accumulation, you might want to hold off on eating those fish until you can get that, those blooms under control. Absolutely. Yeah. Because once you can stop that exposure, then that continuous exposure to the fish will stop and they'll eventually metabolize those toxins. In. Pond Species Profile, the segment where we will showcase the biology and ecology of popular and not so popular pond species. In this episode, we will profile tilapia. Tilapia are actually a group of fish that are native to parts of Africa and the Middle East. They have been introduced to many parts of North America for aquaculture, and you can also buy them to stock into your pond. Tilapia eat a wide variety of food, but are usually stocked in ponds as a biological control for algae. They are a medium-sized fish that can grow quickly in ponds, reaching up to 3-4 to four pounds in a single growing season. Tilapia cannot survive in water temperatures less than 55 degrees Fahrenheit, As such, they should be removed from the pond in the fall to prevent excessive decaying matter and nutrients from entering the pond. Tilapia are great to eat, and you've probably seen them for sale in grocery stores and restaurants. Okay, so I think we've all, you know, if you you didn't already think that these, you know, harmful algal blooms are bad, hopefully now you know that they're (laughs) bad. Um, and I know we spoke mostly about cyanobacteria and, um, and, you know, there are, you know, I think some of the, some of the potential impacts of, of nuisance algae that don't release these toxins, you know, is probably a bit more straightforward for, for people to understand. And I'm sure you've probably encountered those with restricted use and things like that. And so, so I guess now that we, we know that these things are bad, you know, um, 
I guess the next step is, you know, how can we prevent these from happening in the first place? Yeah, so if you think about management as a whole, you can kind of compartmentalize it by the long-term or preventative tactics and then the short-term or you know proactive and reactive tactics, which uh, are very different and sometimes they get blurred a little bit. But the preventative measures that you could take would be, you know, if you have control over the nutrient inputs to your pond, you know, you can do things like cut out fertilizer use on your lawn. We see that happen a lot with lake associations where people like to have very green lawns and absolutely mm -hmm. no vegetation around the shoreline <laughs> so they can see the water. And that kind of creates the perfect storm, right? Because you're adding nutrients to the land and you're also removing that buffer zone that could help take up some mm -hmm. of those nutrients before they hit the water. So there, there are practical ways that you could just take a look at, you know, are, are any of my practices potentially impacting what's going on in my water and how could I change that and find that happy medium? And, you know, unfortunately there are situations where maybe someone's pond is receiving runoff from a nearby farm that doesn't belong to them. And then, you know, they don't, that, that's where you might not have as much control over the situation unless you want to go start a fight with your neighbor. But, <laughs> but, but things like that, right, external to the pond where, where you could potentially make some changes. And then on the more short term scale, you know, these are tactics that expect to give you results within a matter of hours to days. So those are things that you're doing to solve a problem once you have it. And those are, you know, things like the physical, biological, and chemical tactics that, that are available. So, you know, the one that I work with most commonly is applications of US EPA registered algicides. That's what we find to be a very effective, um, cost-effective, scalable, and available tactic that works really well to target cyanobacteria specifically, but, you know, all algae in general as well. So that, that's one option. Um, and there are several others and it kind of just depends, you know, you can kind of look at it like a, a toolbox. I think there's never going to be a silver bullet. There's never going to be a one and done type management technique that you use, but there's ways that you can use different tactics in combination to help improve your probability of success. So I nutrient think one management of the... would be a big one. <laughs> yeah. I think one of the one of the you know one of the great things about um, some of that long term preventative management you can do is that a lot of the similar um, techniques are useful for a whole range of algae and aquatic vegetation. You know, if you're having some issues with cyanobacteria and you really work hard to reduce the nutrients you add to the land, or or maybe you work hard to maintain some buffer strips or something like that, you're not only going to see positive results on the cyanobacteria, but you're likely going to um, prevent some of the other vegetation issues that you might encounter and so you know it's definitely a more long-term approach and you don't get to see your results straight away but um, but it can have multiple benefits and so um, so I think and you make a great point Sierra that you know often you need a little from column A and a little from column B you might be able to work on mm -hmm. some of your prevention but but you're also gonna um, need to be prepared to to treat those blooms if and when they continue to occur so yeah, absolutely. And and it could be different from year to year. It could be different throughout the year. You know, we have some sites where they have a really bad bloom all season long one year and then the next year nothing. And it could have <laughs> to do with um, a lot of the times we see it really has to do with the what the weather is looking like in the spring, because if we have a really cool spring with a lot of rain, that tends to push back the issues with blooms. And what they really need most is time to get established. So if they don't have uh -oh. as much time earlier in the year, then the problems likely aren't going to be as bad later in the year. But then, you know, conversely, if you have a pretty warm spring with less precipitation, that's kind of a red flag of, I need to be prepared to act early this year. Okay, that's good advice. That's a really um, good tip. <laughs> And one of the things I was going to ask you earlier, and you mentioned that, you know, these cyanobacteria and, and other algae, for that matter, too, is um, they're naturally occurring in most systems, right? And so so if you're not having a bloom, is that something you should still be worried about? Or are they at, are they at sufficiently low levels where even if, if they are releasing some toxins, it doesn't tend to be an issue? Yeah, so they are naturally occurring. And that's one reason why we like to do monitoring for you know, different lakes and ponds because if you can regularly grab a sample, check the cell density and see that it's really not increasing and there's no toxins present, then you know, you're, you're in the clear. So yeah, you're right. Just because it's there, it doesn't mean there's risk. It has to do with 
the cell density and whether or not toxins are being produced and, you know, kind of the ripple effects too of, of what that bloom could do if it did get out of control. So yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely a matter of kind of just keeping track of things, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit higher maintenance than most people would like, but it's worth it in the end. Yeah. Particularly if it means the difference between being able to swim and, and fish and, you know, all of that stuff and, and not, and, you know, I, I often tell people with a lot of vegetation, you know, I was just talking about, you know, how, how high my lawn is at the moment now that it's <laughs> warm and I'm like, you know, I've got to get out there mowing it all the time. And, but with, but with, um, aquatic vegetation, you know, it, it, there is a little bit of that snowball effect with it. Right. And I think algae and cyanobacteria, um, the, that snowball effect is the greatest because they're able to replicate so quickly. And, and, you know, like, I think if you can keep an eye on levels and keep them low and, and, um, you know, there's, there's a very small snowball and it, you know, it's, there's not much momentum for it to really get out of control. But if you leave it unchecked and that snowball builds and their cell density, like you said, can start to increase then in a pretty short period of time, I would imagine that they, that can, that bloom can really take off. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Those densities can grow exponentially. And once you get up to that point, management becomes even harder too, which is why mm -hmm. we always stress being proactive because when densities are nice and low, you can catch them early. Management is much more effective. It's more durable, which means it lasts longer and you get more bang for your buck that way too, with whatever money you're spending on management. Whereas if you wait till August and it's just basically pea soup out there, uh, it's going to be a lot harder to get mm -hmm. under control. And in many cases too, especially in ponds, when the blooms get that dense, the oxygen, uh, you know, demand is very high in, in those waters. So it might not be safe to do, you know, an algicide application or any other form of management at that point, because then you risk harm to uh, non-target organisms from the oxygen consumed from the death of those algal cells. So it's definitely, um, you know, something to, there's many reasons to be proactive is what mm -hmm. I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, so you mentioned the, you know, the, um, you know, the way to, to treat and to, um, you know, to, to manage them when you do get a bloom is through these, um, algicides. And so, um, you know, I, I imagine, you know, people are probably somewhat familiar with these, but they, they are what things like copper sulfate or um, are there any particular products that work better on, on um, cyanobacteria compared to the regular green algae that we're used to? Yeah. So with cyanobacteria, um, you know, really the algicides that we, you would use for green algae can be the same as, as with cyanobacteria. So you do have copper sulfate, like you mentioned, and then there are a variety of liquid copper based algicides that have a chelated formulation, which means that copper is bound to an organic compound and that helps get it to the cell, you know, the algal cells before that copper loses its activity in the water. And so those are particularly useful with these surface gums of, of algae. And then there's also hydrogen peroxide based uh, algicide formulations as well that are very effective for cyanobacteria. So there's definitely, there's a bunch of options out there. We typically, you know, look at what the water characteristics are before recommending an algicide because um, different algicides have different pHs, work better in different levels of hardness and conductivity and things like that. So that's uh, one thing we look at, and then we just, you know, look at specifically, are there any requirements from that site and, you know, other factors that involve, like what would make an algicide more effective um, in certain circumstances. So I have a question. We like to tell our listeners to um, make sure that they do at least one survey assessment of their pond um, every year to see what the state is to see if there's any changes over time so that they can make sure they're catching any leaks or anything before they get to the point that they're terrible. Is there anything special that they need to be looking for um, in, in terms of checking to make sure that these algal blooms aren't going to be terrible later? Is there, is there like a telltale sign that they, they are going to have a lot of filamentous algae or a lot of blue-green algae later on in the year? Um, I would say one thing we look at for sure is that nitrogen to phosphorus ratio. So a lot of ponds like to just have their water quality checked once a year. We do that in the spring, just kind of see where things are at. And over time, if you see that NDP ratio decreasing, that might be a sign that there's some excess phosphorus loading to the system that needs to be taken care of. Um, before it starts fueling, you know, more cyanobacteria growth. And 
just in general too, if you look at the, the specific site dynamics. So if you have a retention pond that gets a lot of runoff, that might be one sign that, you know, things are gonna be problematic later in the mm -hmm. year. But yeah, in general, I think it's good to just look at, you know, the general water characteristics and the nutrient levels, specifically nitrogen and phosphorus, you know, at least once or twice a year, just to track that over time and to see if that's shifting and, you know, measure those water parameters and optically with cyanobacteria and algae identification and enumeration and see what's growing there and how that's shifting over time. And that can kind of give you some signs of, you know, is this trending towards my pond going to be completely dominated by cyanobacteria eventually? <laughs> is there something I can do now to, you know, kind of slow this process down? Yeah. Thank you. One question I have with regards to applying uh, algicides um, to the pond is, you know, obviously you don't want to let it get real bad in August because then it may actually be, um, you may have negative impacts by actually applying that, that algicide. Uh, and some of the, you know, some of the things we talk about with, with pond owners is trying to keep on top of things before they get too much of an issue. And, and with filamentous algae, you know, we might recommend some, you know, lower dose applications more regularly to keep on on top of that would is that the same sort of recommendation for some of these uh blue green algae um, situations as well yeah absolutely i think it's always good to stay on top of things and and you know like we said before one way you can do that is to monitor and track cell densities over time and what that can do is prevent you from wasting your time or money right so earlier in the year there's really no way to use algicides preventatively. You know, we can use them proactively once there's growth there, but applying algicide in the absence of algae is really not going to do anything to, you know, prevent okay. it from from showing up later in the year. It's it's really there to just kill the cells that are currently growing there. Mm -hmm. So the best way to stay on top of things from a pond management perspective would really just to be to, you know, have samples regularly taken or at least at a bare minimum just go out and, you know, make some visual observations of the pond. And unfortunately, like we said too, you know, cyanobacteria can be there and you might not see it. And that's when it's at those low levels. That's when you want to be treating. So it is best to have it sampled, but at a bare minimum, you know, you could start to see, oh, maybe there might be a little surface film forming here or the pond water looks a little more green than it usually does. And that mm -hmm. kind of gives you signs that something's definitely ramping up in there and it would be time to treat. And you're exactly right, Mitch, it's, you know, by treating early, you can use lower doses of those products. That way you're spending less money and you are, you know, lowering the risk to non-target organisms as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's that's really great advice. And, and um, you know, we've mentioned getting, you know, getting some water samples tested a few times now in this episode. And so if someone is looking to get some water samples tested, do you have... Um, you know, places that you can point them where they can, I imagine working with a, with some professionals, they can get it tested that way. Are there labs that they can just sort of drop the water sample off and, and just, you know, pay for some one-off testing? How does that work? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, at Aquatic Control, our laboratory does that as well. We offer um, algal identification and enumeration services. We offer toxin testing. We do provide kits for customers that we just send them the, the cooler kit. It has all the bottles and everything they need and all the instructions yeah. to send in a sample. And there are, you know, other labs throughout the, the Midwest too that you know, do, do that same type of work. So there, there's definitely labs available and, you know, we, we make it so that it's very user-friendly and straightforward for the customer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. And it's a little bit, you know, I imagine some people might be reluctant to pay a little bit of money to get some of these things tested, but that, you know, I think if you think of it a little bit like insurance, right, you, mm -hmm. you pay a little bit of money so that you don't have to pay a lot of money later. And not only, only that, but you may lose the use of the resource that you really love to use. And so, um, you know, it's it's a little bit of insurance that can help keep your pond healthy and, and keep, help keep you safe and your, and your animals safe when you're using the pond. So, yeah. Absolutely. And it can also save you from having to use really high volumes of algicide later in the year, mm -hmm. um, you know, if you catch it early. So, yeah, there's exactly like you said, it's like insurance. And I know it, it's hard to justify that cost when you look at your water and you think, oh, I don't have a problem. Um, I definitely understand that, yeah. but yeah, there's, there's numerous benefits to keeping track of things, especially early in the year. 
So Sierra, we like to ask our guests if they have any recommendations for our listeners to learn more about your topic today, harmful algal blooms, or anything that you find interesting, whether they be podcasts or magazines or any website that they can learn more. Yeah, so for harmful algal blooms in general, um, you know, if we're looking at Indiana, the Indiana Department of Environmental Management has a good page for just giving general information about harmful algal blooms and what their recreational guidelines are. And those are the values that they use for public lakes throughout Indiana and when they decide to, you know, post different advisories for, for swimming and things like that. Um, as far as just other general information, I did write a paper with uh, David Osborne, the Extension Purdue agent, and that, I'm not sure, he might have a way to distribute that, but I would also be happy to, to send you the PDF for that as well. And that's just a general information, kind of like what we talked about today. Nothing too technical and nerdy, but you know, <laughs> yeah. helpful for management, yes. <laughs> yeah, we'll make sure we, I'm sure I can find a link to that, and we'll link to that as well as the the IDEM website um, in our show notes, so... Perfect. And what about if people want to get a copy of the number of theses that you've written throughout your <laughs> grad school? <laughs> oh, I'm sure you could find those online too. But yeah, if, um, if there's any interest in, you know, publications, I can definitely share those as well. <laughs> okay, that's great. Yeah, I know uh, for a while there I was using, using my uh, hard copy of my thesis to prop my laptop up a little bit. So <laughs> most use that you're going to get ever. Yeah, you pretty much never want to look at it again after those years. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Thanks again for joining us, Sierra. It was really great to learn more about harmful algal blooms um, and to really understand what they are, what causes them, and how we can manage them. So um, I imagine our listeners might have, you know, you know I, I'm sure you've answered many questions our listeners might have, <laughs> and, and if they have more questions, uh, you know, we'll provide some information that they can reach out to you and, and get some of those answers. So. Absolutely. Well, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Great. Thank you. Did you learn anything new today, Mitch? I learned a lot. You know, I'm a fish guy and, and I've been trying to learn about plants and algae as much as I can. But, um, you know, cyanobacteria and blue-green algae, that's really been a bit of a um, something off in the distance that I know about but didn't know too much about. And so mm -hmm. I learned it was really interesting to to learn that they can float and that's why they get the, the scum. Yeah. They cause that scum. Uh, and, and I thought too that, you know, it was certain species that release these toxins and they just do it all the time. But to hear that they do it sometimes and sometimes they don't do it, that was also mm -hmm. very interesting to hear. So how about you? Megan? And a little unnerving that yeah. it, it, it could be fine one day and then the next day you're having a reaction, whether it yeah. be a rash or respiratory issues or nerve issues. Yeah, it was. Yeah. I knew that they caused problems, but just just hearing her say all the problems at one time was like, whoa. <laughs> yeah, I think I think Sierra summed it up well there at the end where she said, just because it looks fine doesn't mean it is fine. And I think, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, including some water testing and, and, and uh, testing for um, algae as part of your routine monitoring mm -hmm. could be a really good, a really good thing. And doing it early in the spring so that you're checking for, okay, these levels look a little bit higher or lower than they should be. These may indicate xyz later on in the summer yeah exactly and you might be able to identify you know a potential problem that you might have and you can get on top of it with some maybe early treatment or something and and you yeah you can still use that water body as opposed to getting to a bloom where all of a sudden you've got huge levels of toxins and mm -hmm. you have to close your pond or your lake down for for months at a time yeah so uh, if you enjoyed this episode, please uh, subscribe to the podcast, give us a like, um, tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is still is still um, important. So tell your <laughs> friends about us. Um, if you um, want to check out any of the resources from today's episode, those links will be in the show notes. Uh, we also have uh, a YouTube channel, so you can check out our YouTube channel if, if you're uh, looking to, to listen to these podcasts in, the, in another way or check out some supplemental videos. Um, and if you have, uh, if you're interested in the other natural resources, university podcasts, please check those out as well. We have one on deer, one on habitat and one on prescribed fire. Yeah. If you have any feedback for us, you can shoot us an email or take the survey that's in the show notes. Give us some information about you, what kind of pond you're managing. Um, if you have topics for future episodes, let us know. We're always looking for suggestions. 
absolutely and uh get out there and enjoy your ponds and your lakes you know um you know it's it's getting warm you've probably already done some fishing or swimming or whatever and and you know while you're out there maybe keep an eye on things you know take some photos you know maybe record the size of the fish that you're catching just do mm -hmm. a few things that might help your pond management and you know if you're always trying to just do one thing more than you've done in the past then at some point you'll end up in a better situation than you are now yeah. so little steps great well, thanks again for joining us and we'll see you all for the next episode. Bye. Cheerio. Pond University is hosted by Purdue University and Illinois Indiana Sea Grant. Pond University is part of the podcast network Natural Resources University, which is supported by the Renewable Resources Extension Act. If you liked Pond University, then check out the other podcasts in the Natural Resources University podcast network. Purdue University and Illinois Indiana Sea Grant are equal opportunity, equal access, and affirmative action institutions.